Christ. Seven years of college down the drain. Might as well join a fucking Peace Corps. <laughs> Today I'm Mr. Media. I'll welcome, excuse me, I will welcome Rick Meyerowitz, best known in the past as a cartoonist, but now author of the immensely wonderful new coffee table book, Drunk, Stoned, Brilliant, Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon insanely great. Stick around. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media show right on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher is smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free app at www.stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media. So little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 600 archived celebrity interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by the Party Authority. US. Planning a wedding, mitzvah, or corporate event in the New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania area? For any and all occasions, call the Party Authority nationwide at 1 800 Dial BJs. That's 1 800 342 5357, where one call does it all. Holy shit! This comedian is recorded live before a studio audience of still voluptuous former photo funnies models in the new new media capital of the world and home of the American League East champion Tampa Bay Rays, St. Petersburg, Florida. This is a public disservice message from the National Lampoon Radio Hour. Don't waste your evenings doing volunteer work at your local mental hospital. Remember, even if you do, the crazy people there will probably think you didn't. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I grew up in some alternate reality. There was no Internet when I was in my teens. We barely had FM radio and UHF television reception in Central Jersey, and cable TV was unheard of. But somehow I managed to find plenty of inappropriate media influences nonetheless. I read comic books by the pile. They soon led me to investigate other newsstand publications. I knew about Playboy from my dad's stash in the attic and was a very young subscriber probably too young. I also discovered an anti-establishment humor magazine called the National Lampoon, which flipped a very different switch in my post-adolescent mind. At first, I will admit, I mostly read the comics and the photo funnies. I was astounded by the women with enormous natural breasts and the long-haired dudes who ultimately were verbally abused and sometimes physically abused by them. But over time, I came to appreciate the short stories, the political satire, and the don't trust anyone over 30 attitude. And that's kind of weird now that I'm 50 and one of them. Over time, I learned about the men. Uh, there were a few women, including Sherry Flanagan and Ann Beach, but not many, who created and promulgated the Lampoon. To me, Doug Kenny, Michael O'Donoghue, Rick Meyerowitz, Tony Hendra, Sean Kelly, Brian McConkey, uh, Jerry Sussman, P.J. O'Rourke, were amazing talents. I wanted to produce offbeat, irreverent stuff like them. Now, although I do have a National Lampoon rejection letter somewhere in the files, instead, I wound up interviewing them instead. I was a huge fan of Chris Miller's work before he co-wrote Animal House. Interviewing him for the campus radio station at the University of Miami back in 78 was, and still is, a big thrill. Cartoonist Arnold Roth has been a guest on this show, as was Jahan Wilson. So was writer Larry Rasso Sloman. And I was even quoted in a Stan Max Real Life Funnies, but that was in the Village Voice, not the Lampoon, where he did a lot of work. All of which leads me to this moment, in which one of the guys who was literally present at the birth of the magazine is about to join me to talk about his wonderful new book, Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon insanely great. Rick Meyerowitz, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you, Bob. Here I am. I uh, listened to your so former guest while I was hanging on and uh, thinking uh, I would love to sit down in a bar with him and find out more about his uh, life and career. Sounded really interesting, especially that whole story about Lyndon Johnson and Golda Meir. 
<laughs> you know, it's funny, Rick. I knew the people who were just tuning in now don't know what we're talking about, but I, uh, I just recorded a, an interview with uh, uh, radio, radio legend uh, Barry Farber, and I knew that you were you were uh, on the switchboard, and I was thinking, must be thinking, what a what a what a what a strange change in, in topics, <laughs> varied to this. And he mentioned High Times Magazine in his interview, and you just mentioned Larry Ratto Sloman, who was the editor of High Times Magazine. Uh, I wanted to get I, into the I, interview I, with him. Anyway, I, I think so I'm actually, you know, now that I think about that, I've interviewed two editors of High Times because I also had Mike Edison on, and he was the editor for a long time. Yeah, you know, Larry was the original editor. But anyway, uh, yes, a brand new book, <laughs> Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Dead, The Writers and Artists Who Made the National Lampoon Insanely Great. And it was insanely great for a lot of years. And then it wasn't so great for a little while. And then it was kind of awful and hardly published, and now it doesn't exist. So uh, there you go. It uh, ran a cycle like everything else. Well, you you cut right to the to the time when it wasn't so good. So I'm going to cut right to the question I had for you about that. If uh, if there had not been a book called Spy: The Funny Years, would would your book have been National Lampoon: The Funny Years? <laughs> you know. It's uh, when that book came out. I had already sold the idea for this book to Abrams, Harry Abrams, a big uh, art publisher, and uh, we were beginning preliminary work on it when the spy book was published. And I didn't have a title yet, and I thought, "Damn, the funny years! That's pretty good." But no, we. Uh, I was lucky enough to think of this title, and I like it a whole lot better. It's a little more striking on the newsstand, and it kind of describes. Yeah. Oh. Everybody that was there in the 70s, except me. I wasn't <laughs> drunk or stoned. I'm not dead. And I was hardly brilliant. But I did manage somehow to produce <laughs> this big, fat, 320-page color book that you better put an extra support under your coffee table for because the thing weighs 50 pounds. It, we I, heavy I, you know, I have it. I'm sorry, go ahead. I said we used heavy paper. <laughs> I actually have it next to me. It's sitting on top of my uh, my printer, just so it's at the ready here. And uh, the printer does look like it might be sagging a little bit. <laughs> I love a heavy book, um, don't you? Pardon? I love a heavy book, don't you? Absolutely, except when I have to carry it around, in which case I'm I'm quite glad that the Kindle was in, uh, introduced. <laughs> um. Rick, uh, how did you get involved with the Lampoon? You go back to, you weren't at the actual conception, but you were there at the beginning of publication. I believe. How did you get involved? Yeah, who knows what conception is, really. Um, uh, Doug Kenny and Henry Beard came to New York with their business partner, Rob Hoffman, from Harvard in uh, 1969, and they signed a deal to create a national humor magazine, and that was in the spring of 69. And when they were done with school, uh, they signed a deal with a publisher of small magazines called 21st Century Publishing. And when they arrived in the city in the fall, late summer, early fall of 69, one of the first things they did is consult one of their mentors at Harvard, who, uh, the writer George Tro. And George brought on Michael O'Donoghue. And Michael O'Donoghue was a writer uh, with George Tro of a movie called Savages, which uh, the script had been done by some time, I think it was released in 69. And uh, Michael was a revolutionary in humor. He was the guy that said making people laugh is the lowest form of humor. And that became the credo of the National Lampoon, which is uh, humor. If it's really funny, it doesn't have to make you laugh. It may hurt a little bit. Like the old doctor line, right? This is going to hurt a little bit. Um, and that's what the Lampoon did at its best. Well, anyway, Michael and I knew each other from a magazine called Evergreen Review, where he was doing a regular feature and I was doing illustrations, and we'd become friends. And Michael called me and said, I've just met these guys who are starting a national humor magazine, and I think you should meet them. And that's what I did. I came aboard in September of 1969, and I became friends with them. We met frequently. We had really great times. And it wasn't until April of 1970, 40 years ago, that the Lampoon published their first issue. 
40 years ago. It's a lifetime for some people, longer than a lifetime for some people. Yeah. And, you know, it's, uh, it's extraordinary to think uh, that so many things started back then. 40 years is a long time. But there it is. The Lampoon oh, published them. They had 10 great years, Bob. And then mm-hmm. uh, 10 years of producing work with diminishing results. And that was it. There is no Lampoon anymore. It seemed like the first 10 year was about creating, really creating interesting, funny, smarmy material. And the second 10 years, which was mostly after the success of Animal House and, and Vacation, was more about keeping the brand alive for, for uh, legal purposes than about producing something, you know, that would be funny. Yeah, I think smarmy really describes the second decade uh, rather than the, uh, at least the second half of the second decade, rather than the first decade. The Lampoon always did risque things because they had an audience of young men. For the most part, it was young men. You know, they uh, at their peak in the early 70s, they were selling a million copies a month. And they had something called the pass-along factor. And the pass-along factor was every college dorm where 10 or 20 people would read the magazine after somebody paid for it. And uh, you had vast numbers of young men reading this. So the material required for the magazine was smart material, but also with a mix of sexy material in it. And smarmy only happened later when the best, most literate, smartest editors left. And uh, the magazine began to be run by people with a more kind of common experience. And their touch wasn't as ingenious as the... uh, So even a parody of smarmy just looks smarmy, as opposed to really sharp and funny. And these guys at the beginning... And and the point I'd love to make with this book, and really the reason why I'm doing this and why I did this book, is that... I want the word brilliant is on the cover in really big letters. Uh, these were really smart, really brilliant guys. They were smarter than they were funny, and that's the thing that needs to be known. This wasn't just you know big boobs and uh, girls in bikinis and fart jokes. That came later in the eighties uh, when the magazine was taken over by uh, editors who. Uh, you know, had that particular aesthetic. But in those early days, these were really amazingly smart guys. And they thought nothing of doing a parody of uh, the the New York State Bar Exam or doing a parody of uh, the Code of Hammurabi. I mean, they made jokes that were really high humor. And sure, in the same issue, there was a girl getting undressed. And but they tried to do it in a high-minded and hilarious way, and in a very different way. It was, it was a mix of uh, low humor and I, th- I think uh, uh, Tony Hendra, one of the Lampoon editors, wrote that uh, the magazine had a unique high-low style of comedy, incredible disgustingness, disgustingness paired with intellectual and linguistic fireworks. Mm-hmm. And that's what it was. Yeah, I think intellectual and linguistic fireworks. Uh, I'll let you guess which part I appreciated when I was a teen and which part I appreciated uh, yeah. later. The disgustingness, you know. Everybody, <laughs> yeah. everybody has some. You can't just be high-minded all the time. You need a little disgustingness to, let, you know, leaven the uh, uh, the load. But also the visuals of Lampoon, the look of that magazine was revolutionary at the time. They parodied everything. If they were doing a, uh, you know, a matchbook, it looked like a matchbook. If they were doing a set of make-believe stamps, it looked like a, it looked like a set of real stamps. If they were doing, uh, you know, an annual report, uh, they did one for the mafia, and they renamed the uh, the Cosa Nostra. They renamed it Cosnosco, and they did an annual report, and it looked exactly like an annual report. It was great. And if it didn't, well, and you give credit uh, in the book, and you give a, a, a wide uh, number of pages to the uh, design directors, which I thought was wonderful because I always wondered who deserved credit for certain things that were in there because they were so real looking. I mean, if you if someone had left uh, 
And then that, an issue of the Lampoon opened to a magazine uh, satire or parody, uh, something like that. And you just all you saw was that. You think, oh my God, that's real. Or like oh, yeah. the, the, the 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 Hitler yeah. thing. I mean, yeah. phenomenal. Um, it's phenomenal in the well, sense. I wanted to ask. It was supposed to look like a travel magazine, uh, a glitzy article in a travel magazine, and it, you mm-hmm. know one of those really fancy travel magazines, and it did. And that's well, and that's a, the secret of it. That's why it worked. Another example of what you were ta- what you were talking about before. You you were talking about the you know parroting the code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi, I can't even say it. But uh, Jerry Sussman did a uh, ten-page Yellow Pages parody. It's like right. he parodied the Yellow Pages. <laughs> you know? Right. He's uh, um, he was a unique talent, Jerry. He had the ability to really burrow very deeply into something, and he risked all the time. Came right to the edge of risking not making it funny because, after all, the Yellow Pages aren't that funny. Um, and he believed it had to be perfect and just a little bit off. And that's what this Yellow Pages is. There's five of those uh, ten pages printed in this book. I uh, couldn't use all of them, but I think five pages gives you a pretty good idea of what he was after. He did a really great job on it. Such a funny guy. Well, um, Rick, I need to take a uh, just a really quick break. Uh, this is Bob Bandelman, and uh, you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with Mick. <laughs> I can't even talk. Call me Rick. Call me Mick. Mick, you know him best as Mick. Rick Meyerowitz, uh, an artist and, of course, the author of Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon insanely great. And we will be right back. Now, before I say goodnight, my uh, sponsor would like to bring you an important message. Ever thought of hosting your own radio show? Now you can by registering at blogtalkradio.com. While you're there, check out our selection of premium packages. To start your own show today, visit blogtalkradio.com. Owing is a message from the American Safety Institute. Make sure that your children brush their teeth thoroughly after eating brightly colored mushrooms, odd-looking berries, and other things they may find in the woods. These foods often harbor germs that can cause tooth decay. Remember, don't be a careless person. Be a care more person. Now, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Radio interview with Rick Myrowitz, not Nick, artist and author of Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon insanely great. And uh, Rick, I got to ask you, you, you mentioned uh, Michael O'Donoghue uh, as the person who brought you into the fold. And I, you, you, you reproduce in the book the first piece that I remember, that I can actually remember making me go, I have to see more of this magazine. And that was his, his, uh, his ad or photo funnies, I guess. It was called Underwear for the Death. I still don't understand it. I've read it over again and again, but it's just, it's so ridiculous looking, and the concept is so ridiculous. It just makes me laugh whenever I see it. It's a mystery. And I mean, it's a mystery. No one knows what this was. I mean, it was Michael's very quirky thing. It left you with a, like, what is this reaction? And of course, there were naked women in it without really exciting a purient interest. It was just like, this is curious, and this is strange. And, you know, strange can be funny. And, uh, and by the way, unforgettable. He did a bunch of them. And here's Michael did ten, ten of them. They were, they were photog- like a photo comic strip. Mm-hmm. Anyway, pretty great. Here's what I, here's what I want to know. Did, uh, uh, did, who came first with this look? On the same t- page, there are uh, some photos of Michael... Uh, with his uh, his hat and his coat and the cigarette, mm-hmm. who came first uh, with the, with that look? Was it him or was it Springsteen? Because that's what Springsteen looked like around that same time. 1970. That those photos were taken in uh, probably uh, November of 71, I think. And mm. um, they. Uh, so what was Springfield doing then? I mean, that was a long time ago. Yeah, I, well, that, was, I guess his first album was seventy two, seventy three. So I guess, I guess Michael must have uh, had that look first. 
Yeah, I think so. And but I don't think anybody was copying anybody else. They just it's just the way he looked. Those hats were uh, on the heads of every taxi driver in New York City at some point. Those kind of Irish caps. And uh, now every taxi driver in New York City is wearing a turban, but that's a different story, and that's another change that happens in 40 years. Did, uh, as you put this book together, and I should explain to people that the book is its two things, really. It's a wonderful collection of some of the best work that appeared in the Lampoon, the parodies, the cartoons, the short stories, but it's also um, got a lot of uh, tributes to the people who worked uh, on the magazine, uh, by uh, some by Rick, some by other people who worked on it. And I wondered, were there many stories that you heard or that people told in these, these pieces that you had not heard before? Was there anything that surprised you? Yeah, there were stories that, uh, I, I, there were stories that were familiar to me, and there were other stories that uh, made me laugh. There were uh, stories that were, you know, complete revelations. I can't, uh, you'd, you'd really have to read the book because there are a lot of essays in there. But I was more interested. I wanted to get the essays. I want people to write about other people. At the same time, I realized the work was the preeminent thing in this book. I had to get the work in there. And I could have filled each chapter with uh, stories by one writer about a, or one artist about another writer. You know, it's just, it would have gone on and on, and there would have been very little work in these chapters. This is a book that is essentially a 320-page issue with the magazine. And I, I thought it would be a great idea to give everybody that I wanted to feature in the magazine, who I thought was important to the character of the Lampoon, to making the Lampoon what it was in its heyday, to give them a fat chapter, almost like a portfolio, Bob, so that they could shine. You could see their work, the full range of their work, in, let's say, 12 pages of of work instead of having it, you know, like one page by this guy, and then four more pages uh, by the guy, maybe 50 pages later. And so it's all a kind of collated throughout the book. You wouldn't get a sense of the character of each writer or each artist unless I brought it all together and made these portfolios. And so I felt in a way that I was like an art curator in a museum, that I was curating a collection of National Lampoon work. And as the central artist in the magazine's history, the guy who created the Mona Lisa parody, the Mona Gorilla uh, Animal House, and I, I, although I never did comic strips for the magazine, I wrote and drew 150 articles for them over the period of time that they published. And uh, that's a lot of words and that's a lot of pictures. Some of those, some of those articles I mentioned had 24 pictures in them. I mean, there were a lot of drawings. And so the Lampoon kept me very busy for a long time and allowed me to express myself freely. I was the guy that gave the magazine its look, in a visual look, its very strong graphic look in many ways. And I could go to all the artists and all the editors who I still knew, and I could say, I want your best work, and I want your original work because I'm going to reproduce it in a way that the magazine never was able to reproduce it. The magazine had crappy reproduction, even though they had brilliant mm-hmm. design. The reproduction was often quite cheap. And uh, so this was a chance to make digital scans of really great artwork. And I collected from the artists. I went to visit all of them. And I collected their originals. And I had them professionally scanned so that they glow on the page with good paper and good inks and good reproduction, and suddenly the art looks at it, and a bunch of them have said to me, it never looks so good, mm-hmm. right? Because this, this is just not the way it looked in the magazine. Everyone, including myself, were used to uh, turning in something, a uh, great piece of art, and then seeing the magazine, and it was blah. That's a good word for the radio. Oh. Blah. So, uh, <laughs> you, you know, we... Uh, uh, I was able to go to the editors, and no one said to me, in, uh, "What you know?" To quote Yogi Berra, "Include me out." Nobody said right. that. Uh, they all said, "I want to be part of this," and they made uh, manuscripts available. They wrote essays. They uh, contributed artwork, and it was really great uh, connecting with the ones that I'm in touch with all the time, 
and reconnecting with some of those that I'd fallen out of touch with, that I'd see from time to mm. time. It's, it's, oh, uh, they're, all, they're all still out there, except for those who aren't. Yes. Rick, in the time we have left, left I, I'm going to ask you to indulge me. Uh, there's two people in particular I want to ask you about uh, briefly. Um, one uh, is Chris Miller, who I just uh, have just so enjoyed his work over the years, the short stories. I even liked his, uh, the story that's in here that he tells about uh, the, the Danielle from Photo right. Is there anything you can tell you can tell us about Chris that we wouldn't know? Um, you know, Chris wrote a book a few years ago called The Real Animal House. And mm-hmm. uh, it was published by Little Brown, I believe. And uh, it was his memoir of his years in a fraternity, which was called Alpha Delta Phi, or Delta House, at, Har- at Dartmouth, not Harvard. He was a Long Island guy who went to Dartmouth, and he was part of this fraternity. And the stories that he wrote in the National Lampoon became about fraternity life became the basis for the movie Animal House. He was one, as you said earlier, one of the writers of Animal House. And um, it was his stories that he and the other writers adapted to make that movie. And so Chris wrote this story about the real fraternity house and his real fraternity brothers. And it was quite, quite risque and wonderful to read. And I happen to know the guy who did the cover, and that was me. It seemed a logical <laughs> choice. Uh, and yeah. I think of it as Animal House in the Snow. And Chris lives out in <laughs> California right now, Venice, California. And he's uh, been working in doing screenwriting and working in TV for many years. And that's what and, I think. Uh, finally, Chris. I'm sorry, finally, uh, PJ O'Rourke. Uh, he left, he, he left, the, uh, left the, uh, the National Lampoon and then reemerged, I think, to the surprise of a lot of people as this you know, right wing Republican. Uh, writer, columnist, author. Uh, did any of that surprise the group from the Lampoon, or is that the is that the PJ work that you guys always knew? No, no, because we uh, everyone suspected Peach was a member of the Hitler Youth from the beginning, but we uh, <laughs> you know we kept it quiet. No, we uh, PJ, really smart guy, and could be quite funny, but he had been came from a conservative upbringing and. He fell in with the people at the Lampoon, and he, uh, what would we say, he liberalized up for a while. And then once he left the Lampoon in 1980, the end of 1980, he began to move back towards his roots and what he really felt. And he's, uh, he's, smart. he's a smart guy, and he's got um, uh, no one, I think, begrudges uh, Peach, his, uh, we call him Peach, uh, his uh, natural inclinations, and that's toward the conservative. He, he's not a conservative maniac. Conservative. He's just a conservative guy. He's got a he's got a family. He lives lives in New Hampshire. He's you know what he told me recently. He said uh, he's got three young children. PJ said to me, "I'm having my own grandchildren." Yeah, I saw that. I didn't understand that, but I definitely yeah. saw that. He's probably an old guy. Uh, yeah, I mean, he feel he feels young, but he's uh, you know he's feeling like uh, look at where did all these little kids come from? Why did I wait so long to have them? He's a good guy. I'm going to see him in Austin, Texas, this weekend at the Texas Book Fair, where I'm giving a oh. talk, and uh, PJ is also publicizing a new book. Well, tell him he's welcome to come on here and rebut anything that you said that he disagrees with. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Folks, listen, you can find Rick Meyerowitz's new book, Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Dead, the writers and artists who made the National Lampoon. Insanely great, and it is an insanely great book. Uh, it's in great bookstores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price on mrmedia.com. Uh, Rick, just great talking to you. We really enjoyed the book, and thanks so much for joining us today on Mr. Media. Thank you, Bob. It's a great pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And for more original interviews with America's top humorous uh, authors and uh, uh, artists, surf over to our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Please take advantage of this great offer for Mr. Media radio listeners. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia to get a free audiobook download of your choice when you sign up today. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com slash mrmedia for your free audiobook. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. 
If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. You can also follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, twitter.com slash Angleman, or uh, on Facebook to search Mr. Media Interviews. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day and spend it with us. Thanks for listening. Do you mind if we dance with your dates?